And we have really four wonderful speakers with us uh, today. Uh, Stanley Makuch, uh, who uh, is a graduate of Osgood, if I take it, worth mentioning, uh, and who has been a long time a faculty member at the University of Toronto, uh, as well as somebody who has done pri private practice and has um, a really unique knowledge of the municipal scene. Um, we also have with us, uh, needs no introduction, John Ibbotson from the Globe and Mail, uh, as well as his colleague, Adam Radwinski. Again, uh, are going to be able to provide a pretty in-depth uh, commentary on what uh, is going on in Ontario and Canada more generally. And finally, uh, Denis Saint-Martin uh, from the Université de Montréal, who, uh, if I am correct, has been working with the, the Charbonneau uh, Commission. Um, so without further ado, uh, Stanley Makuch. Being a lawyer who's in court and um, uh, a, a professor at the university, I'm going to stand behind a lectern just because that's uh, more comfortable to me. Uh, and let me say, can you hear that? Does that make sense? Does that sound okay? Uh, let me say uh, uh, at the beginning that I'd like to thank Matt Schumann who assisted me in my, uh, in my research. This is based on a previous paper I did on there being no planning law in Ontario, which looked at um, the exercise of discretion and got me interested in, in these ideas as well as some supreme uh, judgment in the Supreme Court of Canada. So let, me just, let me start then by, by telling you where I'm going in this, uh, this talk. Um, I'm not going to, um, to deal with the traditional uh, idea of corruption, I guess. Um, the tr traditional way that we can look at it is that um, we have uh, bribery, uh, fraud, uh, price fixing, conflicts of interest. Um, those are all aspects of corruption in government in, in Canada and at, particularly at the municipal er, uh, level. Uh, although I haven't seen a lot of it in my almost uh, 30, 40 years of practice and, and teaching, there hasn't, I haven't experienced a lot of that. Um, I did a an opinion on the, the Hazel McCallion thing in Mississauga, which those of you who are from Ontario may know about and didn't find any uh, conflict of interest. Uh, there was a uh, special um, task force set up in Toronto a number of years ago. I gave some advice to, we didn't find too much, of it, one or two, one counselor in particular. There was a study in Toronto about um, computer uh, contracts, found some corruption, but again, the stuff has been fairly fairly narrow. Um, so I'm going to, to shift focus a little bit in terms of what I'm looking at and very different from what you've been hearing this afternoon. We've just heard all about the international scene. I'm down to the very local, the very community city, uh, you know, on municipalities in Ontario, well, Canada a little bit, Ontario in particular, and then the city of Toronto, which is my major experience. And what I'm going to look at then is not that traditional stuff that I just described, but rather the exercise of power for improper purposes or purpose. Um, it's the exercise of power at the local level um, for um, purposes that are unrelated to the legislation that grants the power. Yeah. If we have no limits on power, uh, uh, or if there aren't any, or, then um, <clears throat> that is, in my mind, a, or can lead to corruption. And it reminds me of that, of the adage from Lord Atkin about uh, how power corrupts and absolute cor power corrupts absolutely. And I think there's a lot of corruption at the local level in particular uh, because of the grant of grants of power that we have and the way power is exercised. Um, it's interesting, um, as was pointed out, I'm a graduate of here of this law school and it was here for the opening of the building actually. And, and I remember uh, the dean then, Mr. Just, uh, for, uh, formerly Mr. Justice Ladane of the Supreme Court, starting with um, uh, the concept of, of law and uh, in a way corruption, uh, and I hate to go to a, a, a Quebec case, but uh, nevertheless I will sort of foundation of Canadian law in this area, Ron Corelli and Duplessis, when, when uh, the premier of Quebec, uh, Duplessis, refused a, um, a liquor license to Ron Corelli because he was a Jehovah Witness. And to me, 
that is corruption. That's the use of the power to, to deal with liquor licenses to make sure that they're safe, you know, the premises are safe, that uh, there aren't too many people in it, that the license is used for, uh, only for liquor, whatever, the premises are used in that way. And Duplessis didn't use it for that purpose, he used it for the purpose of, of denying somebody a liquor license because they were Jehovah Witnesses. Interesting, Lord Atkins' um, <coughs> statement comes from him being denied access to Cambridge University because he was Anglican. To me, that is corruption. That is the use of power for an improper purpose, and in some ways, less obvious, obviously, you know, less obvious than you, you see in terms of bribery, et cetera. Um, but it is just as dangerous and just um, as um, inappropriate uh, to, um, to do that, and, and the exercise of that kind of power is just as it misappropriate, uh, uh, inappropriate as, as any other kind of crime that might arise. Uh, it becomes embedded in the, uh, in the uh, political system. Uh, it is uh, the misuse of power the same way that paying people to do things is the misuse of, of uh, their power in, in doing that. So, um, I'm going to focus on, uh, on that issue. And the first thing I'd point out is, is that we have, in Canada now, very wide grants of powers to municipality, municipalities, and I'll talk about that a little bit. And I'm going to then talk about why uh, I think there needs to be some restraints on that power, at least in a process sense and a, in a political system sense, that there needs to be controls to be put in place. There need controls to be put in place, both politically and procedurally, to try to limit that power uh, that's that's been granted. And so, it's that kind of that the kind of cons uh, corruption I'm going to talk about, the misuse of power, how it that uh, power is being granted, uh, and is <clears throat> and how it's able to be misused, and then what kind of controls can be put on it. So in terms of the, the power that's being granted, it's fair to say that um, municipal powers, and that's what the area I'm talking about obviously, has been very, very widely expanded in recent years. Um, I can say in some ways <coughs> I'm responsible for it, not responsible for it, but contributed to it because the Supreme Court of Canada referred to my own textbook which advocated this um, and has expanded their interpretation of municipal powers. And uh, uh, it was Madam Justice McLaughlin in a dissent in a, a Shell and City of Vancouver case that said that, that municipal powers had to be interpreted broadly, that we shouldn't narrow them, that municipalities had to have broad powers and we shouldn't narrow their, uh, narrowly interpret their, their jurisdiction. And that, in that case, although she was a dissent, it became a majority view in a subsequent case. The old idea of looking for express authority for municipalities was abandoned, and the new concept is they can do almost anything that they think is appropriate. And legislation has now changed to allow that to happen. So we now have, for example, in the Municipal Act in Ontario, uh, which was um, an act, a new act, which was enacted in 2001, the powers of the municipality under this or any other act shall be interpreted broadly so as to confer broad authority on the municipality to enable it to govern its affairs as it considers appropriate and to enhance the municipality's ability to address or respond to municipal issues. And uh, municipal issues isn't defined, so it's whatever the local government thinks it wants to do, it can do. And um, the City of Toronto Act uh, which is a 2006 act, uh, reinforces or even expands on that because it says that the purpose of that act is to create a framework of broad powers for the city which recognizes that the city must be able to do the following things in order to provide good government. Determine what is in the public interest for the city and respond to the need of, needs of the city. So it can do, what, again, exercise power, to do, determine whatever is in the public interest for the city. It determines that, no limitations on that, no standards for that, no definitions for that, 
and responds to the needs of the city again, whatever it thinks. Another section of the act goes on to say, the powers of the city under this or any other act shall be interpreted broadly, again, building on what the Supreme Court of Canada said when it referred to uh, as I say, my text about why the, these powers should be broader, so as to confer broad authority on the city to enable the city to govern its affairs as it considers appropriate and to enhance the city's ability to respond to municipal issues, again, no, defining that, and finally, the city may pass bylaws respecting economic, social, and environmental, uh, sorry, may pass bylaws respecting the economic, social, and environmental well-being of the city. So, very broad, ill-defined powers. In fact, I raised the question with my students, have we now created a new province, a quasi-province, with this kind of legislation? Because there's no limits on the powers that, that are granted. And, the, uh, the act goes on to say that uh, there's only a conflict with provincial legislation or federal legislation if, if complying with the local, the local bylaws leads to a breach of that federal legislation again, or, or provincial legislation and therefore again expanding on the ability of municipalities to do whatever they want. So we have that situation in the, which has occurred in the last 10, 15 years from very narrow powers for municipalities to exceedingly broad, ill-defined, unrestricted power given to them. Um, now, they can't be the same as federal powers, but they can be, as, as I say, quasi-provincial, in my, in my view, having um, given that kind of power by the province to the municipalities, and in particular to the city of Toronto. And then with the question is, well, what kind of corruption might occur for that, what kind of um, abuse of power, using the power for purpose, purposes that are beyond, well, beyond any limitations. And <laughs> since we don't have any limitations, that's, that's sort of difficult, but there are, there are a few. And let me just, um, let me go through and say that what I want to talk about then is, and I'm gonna try and keep this brief, I've already um, I haven't got too much time left here. Um, there was a report in, in, done in the, uh, in the uh, late, late 60s, early 70s about um, civil rights in Ontario, um, and it set out some standards for dealing with how governments should act and what restrictions we should have on governments, including local governments. And um, there were, uh, there, these standards are, are basically Government interference with the actions and the rights of individuals should occur only when necessary and to the extent necessary. Two, that's the first one. Secondly, elected representatives to whom citizens may appeal for help should be, that should be provided. Thirdly, wide dis dissemination of, of information to inform individuals of their rights. Four, a fair, procedures for the a fair procedure for the exercise of government authority. Five, reasons to be given for the exercise. Six, judicial supervision of it and seven administrative appeal to review tribunals. And in fact, um, we've done very little in that area and moved in the opposite direction of that, uh, what's called the McCrory Report for uh, Civil Rights in the Province. Because what we have is, um, as I say, these very pro broad powers generally. And let me just give you one example which I find sort of interesting. Uh, I go to, uh, I went to a parking lot a couple of weeks ago, saw a receipt for my parking ticket which said that there was a 42, 42 cents of every dollar I paid for my parking ticket uh, uh, for parking space in the parking lot, municipal parking lot, uh, 42 cents went to government services such as parks, recreation and other roads uh, at the local level to the municipality, the city of Toronto. And I said, well, isn't that wonderful? You know, we got 42 cents of every, every um, dollar that someone pays for parking. That may seem fine, and on its surface does, it seems to me, except that there is some limit on that power to, to, impo to charge a fee for parking. The City of Toronto is not given the power to impose a tax, a sales tax of any kind. This is a sales tax, so there's a 42% sales tax on parking not allowed because there is that one limit. The general powers are there, they can do what they want, but there's that one limit, 42 cents 
on, uh, uh, on every, uh, sorry, the sales tax for, of 42 percent is not allowed. The government does it. It's a good thing, we might say. Instead of raising it in the property tax, which is what was required, they've raised it through this, this extra charge, this ch tax on parking. But then nobody thinks about the impact that that may have on suburban dwellers who may be less um, able to afford the, uh, that tax, the single mother who has to drop her kids off at kindergarten and then go to park in a parking lot and take the subway in, to downtown. So the impact of transferring the tax to the parking, uh, to the parking, um, uh, the cost of parking can have a profound impact. It's not allowed, specifically prohibited. Nobody challenges it. Neither lawyers nor, nor city uh, officials. The politicians love it. Nobody seems to care about it. But to me, it can be seen as a, an abuse of power. Okay? And that kind of thing occurs throughout the local government system. People can challenge it if they wish, but nobody really recognizes it, and it's you know, seen as good because uh, we need the money, but it also then takes away the discipline that, it, that the, the, the legislation is designed to impose uh, on the, on the uh, use of the property tax. And so we have this kind of bizarre situation, in my mind, where the power is, is uh, abused. And um, so that's one example. I mean, I can give others where uh, the, other, the, the city of Toronto had a, uh, a, a fee for um, a plastic, gar uh, plastic shopping bags. The, um, the five cent fee that was imposed, and again, thought the power is pretty broad. Looking at it from the point of view of the environment, a good thing to do to, ha to reduce uh, the use of uh, plastic shopping bags. I looked at, is there any limitation on the municipality's ability to do that? And it seems not. One might have thought that, and, and, and then the report that dealt with it said, well, they can't impose a, a tax on, on shopping bags. Uh, you know, when you go for grocery shopping, you get the, the bag. Can't impose a tax on it, so the fee was imposed to be paid to the, um, to the, uh, the grocery store corporations for the uh, shopping bags instead of to the government. So it's not a, a tax because it's not going to the government. It's the municipality setting the price of goods. All right, it's setting the price of, of shopping bags. They can be no less than five cents. Every time you sell one, you have to pay five cents. Again, no challenge to that. Nobody looks at the limitation of the power. Maybe good. I don't know what it does in terms of of who can afford the shopping bags and, and, and the community and who, uh, who should bear that cost in terms of raising money with that mechanism and, and whether it's necessary. But again, again, we have that kind of abuse of power, it seems to me, because there are no limits and it's difficult to, to, uh, to see any limits. So that, those are just two examples. I, I go into others in my, uh, in my paper. There are, I gave you a list of problems um, with respect to uh, due process. The municipalities in Ontario and in particularly the city of Toronto have process requirements. Every person gets five minutes to speak to council before a decision is made. If you're a proponent of a particular matter, you have five minutes. You may have 15 people after you all speaking against you, but you only get five minutes and if you go first, you don't get a chance to respond. So that the, the, the process there is one that does not, is not in my, in my view, fair if we're trying to look at um, abuse of process and the, and the idea that the, uh, the process should protect uh, at least people's rights. Uh, similarly, with, re with respect to that, no right to see a plan, like a report that comes from staff in advance. So one goes as a proponent or indeed an opponent to a matter Reports are produced, they're handed out there. No chance to uh, prepare in advance to know what the argument is. No chance to respond if other people are, are, uh, are disagreeing with you. Only five minutes. And, and again, it seems to me, we forget about the abuse that can arise. And, the, and then, as a, <coughs> I did a study of this for a client, <coughs> actually, 
and find that all, many, of the, many of the reports are inaccurate or contain inaccuracies because there isn't the opportunity to go to, to evaluate them because they're given out immediately before a meeting uh, occurs or at a meeting or while a meeting occurs indeed. And so we have this broadening of the powers. We have other examples where um, councillors who in fact I say are kings and queens in their own wards and so the idea of democracy you know, needs to be examined and I've, I've done that in my paper. Um, we have a situation uh, where councillors can negotiate planning concerns and demand money, facilities, whatever they want <laughs> under, the, under the Planning Act, totally discretionary um, uh, appro uh, approval under the Planning Act to, um, uh, in, in return for a, an increase in height or density of a building. No right to, uh, to a hearing, no right to an appeal, or the rights to a hearing, the, the meeting are, as I say, five minutes and you have no say afterwards. The councillors are the ones who decide for their own ward. They decide because other councillors will support them and they support the other councillors in other wards. There's no party system. There's no evaluation of how someone gets to that council. Incumbents are almost guaranteed a re-election. And so we don't have many democratic um, safeguards as well in the system. And we have the, the powers being expanded without the controls that um, uh, that might provide for some protection for individual rights in the whole process and some control on that abuse of power. McCrura points out that a hearing is perhaps the, the most important and best way that um, rights can be protected and that le le sorry, the legitimacy of decision making can be ensured because people, if they have a hearing, can question what's going on. They can challenge it, they can bring their own evidence, etc. We've done away with all those rights because we want to make things go very quickly. Statutes that provide for them are, uh, 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 don't apply in, in many municipal cases in order to facilitate the, the speedy uh, decision making. And so, again, we've expanded powers and not given the kinds of protections that I think that are necessary to do that. I haven't gone through all of them. There's not enough time. I see I'm out of time. Before I get the hook, I'm going to uh, stop. I don't want to abuse my time up here. So <laughs> I will stop there and say that there are other, as I gave you the list, there are other um, um, ways that we could try to control that abuse of power, especially when it's been so broadly expanded. But we haven't done that. So we've given this power. And uh, to the extent that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts, absolutely. Um, it, we are, in a, I think, in Ontario and in Canada, because this is a general thrust throughout, uh, throughout Canada, uh, in a treading on, in a dangerous area. So thank you. Thank you, Stan. John Ibbotson. Uh, thank you. Look, I'll be honest with you. I think the purpose of these forums ought to be for us to sit around, uh, speak for no more than three minutes, and then have questions, because the only part of it that's actually any fun is the questions. Um, so I'm going to go for more than three. I'm going to hold it to 15 uh, with any luck, um, uh, because there's another panelist who is a reporter, and whatever our many failings are, we write to length and on deadline. Uh, we'll both keep it to 15, and then we can have um, a, a genuine discussion rather than just uh, a series of, uh, of presentations. I'm also going to use a much more traditional newspaper definition of corruption, if you will. Um, corruption um, is breaking the law to line your own pockets or the pockets of your family and friends, um, driving huge uh, trucks through massive loopholes in the law in order to line your own pockets or the pockets of your friends, or while remaining personally clean, um, using uh, the existing laws or driving trucks through their loopholes in order to keep your party in power and your opponent on the opposite side of the house. Um, there are many other possible definitions of corruption. Uh, these are mine. These are the ones that usually get you on the front page of the newspaper. And the thesis is, is also pretty simple. The thesis is there isn't a lot of corruption. Um, I'm speaking here only at the federal level, though it, it sounds to me as though on, you can make a pretty good case, a case for Ontario as well. Um, although I'll let Adam speak to Queen's Park, which is a different kettle of fish. But at the federal level, aren't many places on earth cleaner than Canada? 
Um, just is. Wish it wasn't, because you know, it's dull, um, but it is. And not only are we pretty clean, uh, we're a lot cleaner than we used to be, and um, a lot cleaner than we used to be before that. In fact, uh, one of the salutary effects of scandals is that they expose corruption and lead to remedies, which is why um, it's so boring in Ottawa. Um, and I'm just going to use five test cases to, uh, to very briefly show you how this worked. The first one, of course, is probably the biggest scandal in Canadian history. It was the Pacific Scandal of 1873. This is a room full of people who know about such things. Um, but you'll remember that in order to get the contract to build the Canadian Pacific Railway, uh, Hugh Allen's CPR gave $350,000 to the Conservative Party in order to buy the, the 1872 election. And I do mean by the 1872 election, because in those days there was no secret ballot. You showed up, you raised your hand, um, someone took a note of it, you walked over to the side, somebody handed you a bill, and you went home. So the $350,000 did buy the election. Of course, Hugh Allen and, and John M. Macdonald both claim it didn't, but there was a smoking gun in the form of a telegram from, from uh, Macdonald to Allen that said, I must have another 10,000, will be the last time of calling, do not fail me answer today. And Adam, why don't we get smoking guns like that anymore? I mean, that's the kind of stuff. Don't fail me answer today. Well, of course, it brought down the McDonald government. Uh, but it did something more important. It led to the introduction of the secret ballot. Elections after that uh, were conducted as they're conducted today by going into a booth. It makes it much, much harder to buy the election because the guy can lie to you and take your money even though he voted for the other guy. So the Pacific, press, uh, the Pacific scandal of 1873 led to one of the most important democratic reforms in this country's history. Another great scandal, one that we tend to forget about, is the scandal surrounding the King-Bing affair. Now again, everybody in this room knows the King-Bing affair. Mackenzie King went to Governor General Bing, um, said, I've been defeated in the House, please dissolve Parliament and call an election. And the Governor General said, no, I don't think so. I think I'll consult the leader of the official opposition to see if he can form a government. Um, he did. The gov new government of Arthur Meehan lasted a week. There was an election, and the election was actually fought about who governs Canada. Is it the Prime Minister, the, gov the, the duly elected government of Canada, or, or is it the Queen's representative? And of course, um, Mackenzie King won a big, uh, big victory, and general precedent that was established was, yeah, the Governor General must take the Prime Minister's advice. Uh, I wrote a column, actually, by the way, about 10 years ago that said that Bing was right and King was wrong. I thought about it a lot since. I was wrong. Uh, Bing was wrong, and if you agreed with my column, you're wrong. But what we forget about is the fact that the King-Bing scandal was the product, the King-Bing crisis was in fact the result of a scandal, a huge scandal, the Customs House scandal. It was prohibition, the Americans um, had prohibition, we didn't, and a good chunk of Canada's GDP consisted of the smuggling of alcohol across the border into the United States. It's not going to surprise anybody that the Customs Department was completely corrupt. And I'm, I mean, we are talking corrupt here. Everybody was corrupt. And all the border agents were corrupt. All the customs inspectors were corrupt. All of the bureaucracy in Ottawa was corrupt. The management was corrupt. In fact, there was one senior inspector who, who the RCMP, in a, in, a, in, a, in a moment of passion, actually arrested and put in jail. The Attorney General of Canada ordered him released from jail because he was the major fundraiser for the province of New Brunswick, and they needed his services. And the most corrupt person of all uh, was Jacques Bureau, who was the Minister of Customs and Excise. And it was Mackenzie King's highly reluctant decision to finally remove Bureau from Cabinet and punish him by, by sending him to the Senate that caused the scandal <laughs> that brought down the King government. The result of this was, of course, was not just the, um, the expansion uh, of, of the rights of the, uh, of the executive within Parliament and the limitation of the rights of the Queen in Canada, it was as, uh, as well um, the, the, uh, the beginning of a long process of cleaning up corruption inside the public service. It had been on and off, by the way, already for a couple of decades. The first Public Service Reform Act was, was at the turn of the 20th century. Uh, but this was another step down the road of coming in, cleaning up departments, putting new rules in place, limiting patronage, uh, limiting nepotism. It, it, it took place over decades and always was a huge headline that led to the change. This was one of the biggest headlines and produced some of the biggest changes. Um, but they were interesting times. It was only five years later that we had the Beauharnois scandal. Um, not as well remembered, uh, unless perhaps you're from Quebec, but it was um, in 1930 
um, that the, the Bohenwa Light Heat and Power Company gave $700,000 to the Liberal Party. Again, this, these are large sums of money. 700,000 bucks is a lot to throw around today. In 1930, in the Depression, it was massive. But it's not easy to get the federal government to, uh, to uh, agree to allow you to divert the St. Lawrence River uh, so that you can build a power dam on your property. And the King government did allow them to divert the St. Lawrence River so they could build their power dam. So the $700,000 was well invested. Tragically, King lost the election. The Conservatives came to power. They appointed a parliamentary committee. The parliamentary committee discovered the massive corruption that took place over the awarding of the Borhan uh, contract. It led, though, to a big uh, change. Uh, at the time, it, it, and it, again, it was only nascent at the time, but it started a process. And the Liberal Party actually created an independent, supposedly walled off fundraising arm, separate from the actual leadership of the party itself, so that the fundraising activities of the political party could not contaminate the actions of the party leadership. That was an imperfect wall, um, but it was the first time that you know, any bricks actually got assembled. Um, and that wall has been, has been building steadily ever since. Oh, and by the way, it led to the nationalization of Hydro, Quebec, as, as, a, as a side effect. So let's, let's jump forward, because I really, really wanted to get the Gerda Munsinger scandal in here, because she had sex with cabinet ministers in two different governments of two different political parties, and that's not easily achieved. But I can't think of any major reforms that Gerda Munsinger's um, peccadilloes led to. So we'll jump to the one that everyone remembers uh, best of all, and that's the sponsorship scandal where the, the Liberal government, in the wake of the near-death experience of 1995, decided to pour serious money into sponsoring events in Quebec so the Canadian flag could be seen and the Quebecers would understand what a wonderful thing the federal government was and they wouldn't vote to leave the country next time. And happy to say that as a result of a series of stories from the Globe and Mail, uh, led by Danielle LeBlanc, and uh, first on his own and then teamed up with Campbell Clark, um, it emerged that there was a there were accounting difficulties. Um, that was to say, no one could account for where any of the money had gone. Um, it became intriguing enough that the Auditor General came in. She did a quick uh, survey of the books, said every rule in those books has been broken. There's at least 100 million of 250 million dollars that I can't find. I'm calling a full audit and I'm calling in the RCMP. And you know what it led to. It led to the Gomery Commission. It led to the, ultimately the defeat of the Liberal government. Um, uh, it led to the Accountability Act, it led to auditors now in every single department of government. Um, it led to much, uh, it led to several people going to jail, by the way, um, and it led to much, much tighter controls. In fact, some would argue controls that are too tight on, uh, on, on the disbursement of funds uh, at the federal level. Um, that's a lot of change for one scandal. And of course, we'll finish it off, because I promised I'd, I would keep my word, um, with the salient expenses scandal um, that, that embroils us still today. And again, you know it all. Um, three conservative and one liberal senator allegedly spent uh, money, um, charged money for travel and living allowances that they weren't entitled to. Um, they allegedly got caught. They paid it back. Um, nonetheless, several of them have been charged and are awaiting trial. Um, um, uh, one of them, Patrick Brazo, um, has had a particularly rough time. He's gone from being a senator to being a reporter to being a bouncer in a strip club, wh which is a typical progression for a senator, but it usually goes in the opposite <laughs> direction. Um, and we're already seeing uh, consequences to that scandal. Um, incredibly strict new measures have been put in place um, for Senate, ex uh, Senate expenses uh, that have to be publicly accounted for now, that have to be posted on websites. Um, they, uh, that similar uh, controls are going to be put in place for, the, for, the, for members of the House of Commons. It's just a question of which scandal actually brings it about, because I'm sure it will take a scandal to bring it about. Uh, but that's the whole point. Um, if you look at things in 2014, uh, we're at the point now where a government is in danger of being defeated because three conservatives, former conservative senators, uh, charged expenses that they shouldn't have charged, and even not, notwithstanding the fact they were they paid them back, notwithstanding the fact that they were expelled from caucus, and notwithstanding the fact that they had been suspended, uh, uh, one suspects permanently from the Senate, still uh, the government is seen as tottering um, as a result of it. And as a result of it, there will be new, um, new reforms. So whether it's the Civil Service Act of, of 1918, or the Public Service Employment Act of 67, or the Election Expenses Act of 74, the Canada Elections Act amendments of 2000, the amendments of 2003, oh, and by the way, the amendments of 2011, uh, which effectively ban all, uh, not only corporate and uh, 
union donations to political parties, but uh, ban all, uh, but ban federal public funding of political parties as well. So that now you can the only way you can fund a political party in Canada is, is to donate a maximum of 1,000 bucks a year to it. It's pretty hard to buy an MP at a rate of 1,000 bucks a year. Things get better is the point. They're better today than they were in the 20th century, and they're a hell of a lot better than uh, they were in the 19th. Precedent and recent examples suggest that they're going to get better uh, in years to come. I predict that in 67 years and six months, we'll have achieved perfection. Thank you. <laughs> And now for the flip side of the coin, get back. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, first, let me thank uh, Professor Margaret Beer for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here. I'm not a lawyer uh, or a legal scholar. I'm a political scientist, so I'm going to give you a, a political science um, interpretation of what is going on uh, in Quebec. Um, um, as you know, the Charbonneau uh, Commission uh, was created by uh, Jean Charest in 2011 um, and is chaired by uh, Justice Franck Charbonneau. Um, the commission is empowered uh, to uh, look into uh, collusion and corruption in the uh, public contract in the, in the construction industry. And uh, as you can see, it is also empowered to look at any link with the financing of political parties and uh, to paint a picture uh, of organized crime infiltration and to make a recommendation try to try to address those problems. So the mandate is quite broad. Uh, the commission is due uh, to uh, report uh, next spring. Uh, in the past two years, uh, witnesses have detailed a system of bid rigging that saw a cartel of engineering and construction firms uh, obtain public contract from the city of Montreal in exchange for, for a political donation. Uh, revelation made uh, in the commission have led to the resignation of, Le, uh, of Laval Mayor Gilles Vaillancourt, who was arrested and charged with uh, gangsterism. It also led to the resignation of uh, Montreal Mayor uh, Gérald Tremblay in 2012, and it led to the resignation of Montreal Interim Mayor Michael Applebaum, uh, for projects related to zoning changes and bribes worth tens of thousands of dollars. The Commission also heard about uh, testimonies from Tony Accurso, a construction magnet whose empire has had a quasi-monopoly over public contract for more than 30 years. Mr. Accurso, as you can see there, is at the top of a network of more than 60 interrelated enterprises. He is a close friend and business partner of the president of the Quebec Federation of Labor, and his companies have received generous support from the Workers' Investment Fund, the Solidarity Fund. Mr. Accurso has admitted to having links with the Mafia, small connection, he said, a picture released by the commission shows him with Jean Charest during a, fund, a political fundraising. His $10, uh, 10, 10 million dollar yacht, the Touch, has repeatedly appeared in the media and has become a symbol in, of corruption and all the favor, gifts, and bribe given to union bosses and publish, uh, public officials in return for government contracts. This is almost like an episode of The Sopranos, you know, that famous uh, TV uh, drama that was on HBO a few years back. Uh, in two years, the commission has heard almost 200 testimonies. For people like you and I, for social scientists, this is a gold mine. You know? This is not often that uh, scholars, you know, in sociology, in law, in economics, in political science, in anthropology, that we are uh, given access to the inner workings of this informal institution that corruption is in our modern societies. Um, 
This is not so, something that happens very, uh, very often. Um, politicians are not very keen on giving a blank check to judges to look into something as slippery, subjective, and as difficult to define as corruption is. So this is why, and I'm making a bit of publicity, we can talk about that later. This is why I and a group of, uh, of 40 colleagues uh, in Montreal and the rest of Canada, we are, uh, in part, we are putting together a, a funding a proposal to SHIRT for a, a partnership and we are doing this with Transparency International Canada, uh, with uh, the Anti-Corruption Unit in Quebec, the Sûreté du Québec, a dozen government departments, and a, a, a couple of uh, research centers in the United States. Um, and, and because this is what is going on in Quebec with the Charbonneau Commission, I'd say, is a real social experiment. And for us researchers, this is an, for Quebec society, this may be a crisis, but for researchers, it's really an, a, an opportunity. Uh, this is something uh, we need to build knowledge about what works to reduce corruption. How corruption uh, is allowed to spread in, in the economy and in political institution. So this is really uh, an occasion uh, if uh, a business partner, government actors come together and, and make Quebec a success story that we, that we will teach in business school in 10 years, say, here our society, a society, you know, turn around. So I think this is a, a big uh, opportunity for us. Um, so my goal uh, in this, uh, as, you, as you can see from uh, the title of my, uh, I have problem with this, huh? As you can see from the title of my presentation, okay, so, uh, my goal is to try to uh, look at the research evidence in the social sciences and to see what is the evidence that support the idea, the Maclean's idea, that Quebec is the most corrupt province in, in Canada, or as, uh, as the Globe and Mail once called the Belle Province, the little Sweden of North America. So what, what, is, what is the evidence to support one view or, or, or the other. So this is what I'll try to do with you in the next 15 minutes, if you allow me. Um, the Quebec of, uh, uh, the image of Quebec as a, as a, uh, as a social, uh, as, a, as a little Sweden of North America, yeah, focuses on, on its welfare state, its social protection system, and particularly its universalist daycare policy which uh, Tom Mulcair now wants to extend to the rest of the country, and, uh, and he has pledged to invest $5 billion and to create 1 million places in public daycare by uh, 2023. So you have this image, and against that, you have the McLean's image, you know, uh, with the illustration of Bonhomme Carnaval holding a suitcase overflowing with cash to portray Quebec as the most corrupt province in Canada. <coughs> but this image, for us social scientists, is a clear reminder of the role of culture and cultural stereotypes in perceptions of corruption. Bonhomme is, of course, is used as a folkloric symbol of Quebec culture of corruption in general. As you might remember, at the time, the affair ignited passionate debate leading to House of Commons unanimous motion, denunciating the magazine for its prejudice and denigration of the Quebec nation, I quote. Um, but the fact that the word uh, most corrupted were uh, first uh, applied to Quebec by uh, Samuel Huntington in his 1968 book on political order in changing societies went largely unnoticed. A quick look at his work would have revealed that debates about culture and corruption have their origin in broader theoretical argument in the social sciences about the causes of economic and political development. From his early contribution to uh, later writings on the clash of civilization, Huntington was known for his culturalist position, 
treating culture as an explanatory variable to show how cultural attitude and belief hindered or enable progress. Conceive as a set of values and customs that purportedly distinguish one group from the other, this concept of culture was very prominent in functionalist theory. Functionalism interpret each part of society in terms of how it contributes to the stability of the whole society. Corruption in functionalist theory is said to play a number of positive social functions. Sociologists like Huntington and James C. Scott in the 60s argued that high levels of corruption, although at first sight being the exact opposite of a modern social structure, can play an important function in the modernization of societies in the developing parts of the world. Uh, their argument was that political corruption can, among other things, uh, serve as an incentive to join political parties beyond traditional ties like family, ethnicity, or religion. Furthermore, political corruption was seen as an antidote to bureaucratic uh, red tape and as a mean of greasing the wheels of economic growth. Argument emphasizing the functionality of corruption were first developed by Robert Merton, who contended that corruption in the form uh, of the political uh, machine in Tammany Hall, America, fulfill certain social needs not addressed by the formal political system at the turn of the 20th century in the United States. Following Merton, other emphasized the role of patronage in, facilita in facilitating political integration. The interpretation of corruption as the price to pay to keep recalcitrant provinces like Quebec and Newfoundland quiet and the country together has long been at the center of the brokerage theory of party development and elite accommodation in Canada. To quote from Jeffrey Simpson's Spoils of Power, patronage, by offering the benefits to people of all regions, has helped to steer Canada away from parties based on race, religion, or region, which would have led to unstable coalition government. Patronage, whatever its cost, has done its bit for national integration and political stability. The sponsorship scandal that John talked about is the most recent manifestation of this theory. It was permitted to break the rules because we, it was needed to keep the country united, to, <coughs> uh, to keep the system together. So it was, again, a functionalist ag argument in the context of the Quebec uh, referendum in 1995. Um, and the price to pay to keep Canada, uh, to keep Quebec in the Federation is high, as uh, Quebec is dependent, is the most, one of the most dependent on transfers and equalization payments. As commentators and analysts, especially conservative one, like to point out. Uh, this is a figure from the Fraser Institute. So it's, <laughs> so they see, they, they say that, uh, it shows that from since the 1960s, Quebec has increasingly received more from, uh, uh, from uh, Ottawa than it contributes to the collective Canadian purse. Um, this is not false, but on the other hand, when you look um, at equalization payment, it is true that Quebec received half of all equalization payment. But he received, it received, the province received less per capita than Manitoba, New Brunswick, uh, Nouvelle Ecosse, um, um, Nova Scotia, uh, and PI is the province that received the most per capita from equalization. Of course, though, to those who, who focus on, on Quebec as an have not provinces, um, say the province is made poorer because it has a big government that suffocates the economy with too much bureaucracy and red tape. 
And these commentators are only repeating what classical economists and theories of rent seeking, uh, of rent seeking in the 1970s uh, were saying. They, they traditionally view big government as the source of big corruption. And duh, that's why there's more corruption in Quebec. There's more is bigger government. That's it, you know. But that's not true. <laughs> Research in the 19, 1980s on the new institutional economics led by uh, uh, my idol, uh, Douglas North, um, showed that this idea was not true, that what matters is not the quantity, the size of government. What matters is the quality of its institution, political, uh, judicial, uh, business uh, institution. Uh, and that, um, and in the new institutional economics, institution and policies are no longer the cause of corruption and poor performance. On the contrary, good institution, i.e. good governance, uh, is seen as playing a key role in nurturing economic uh, and social growth. Uh, my friend Bo Rothstein from the University of Gothenburg in Sweden uh, in, in his recent book defines quality of government as the impartiality of institution that exercise government authority. And when you look at the best, you know, the A-League, who are the country that are, are lead the way in terms of being the least corrupted? The Scandinavian. And they have the biggest government of them all. They, they taxes, they have a big public sector and so forth. But they are systematically categorized as the least corrupt uh, countries in the world according to the TI index. And they are also the country that have the most of those things that people like you and I consider to be good like uh, equality, less poverty, uh, good institution, good social capital, low crime, good environment, and uh, uh, stuff like that. Um, if we look also at the ranking of, uh, this is a study on the quality of government institution in the European Union. Again, the top of the league, the big government, the, the Scandinavian. So the idea that big government create big corruption, eh, it's some kind of a, not, a, not, not strong. The empirical evidence, not very strong. Let's look at Quebec now. In terms of its social spending. It's just behind Denmark and Sweden and it spent, you know, 47% of, of its GDP. This means that Quebec, even compared with many OECD countries, appear to have an especially large public sector. Public sector spending accounts for an even larger share of Quebec's GDP than for Finland, the Netherlands, and Norway, although they are all known for considerable government intervention in their economy. Quebec government spend more relative to its GDP than the Canadian average at 39% and the United States at 34%. If we now look at some res uh, research on inequality and corruption, social scientists have begun to establish extremely strong correlation between inequality and corruption. Uh, we don't know about causation yet. We don't know if more inequality breeds more corruption or if more corruption breeds more inequality. But what we know is that the two go together, huh? very, very, they, they very uh, often together. And when you look at the country that have the least inequality huh, here and the least corruption, again, you find uh, the Scandinavian, uh, the Scandinavian country are all also there. So they have the less inequality and less corruption. 
If we look at inequality um, in, um, in, in Quebec and in Canada, um, we see that in Quebec, in 2010, the richest household had an average income of 4.7 times higher than the poorest one. And when we compare this inequality with, uh, that in the, with the other OECD uh, countries, we see Quebec falls in the middle of the, of the ranking. Of the countries that are more egalitarian than Quebec, most are, again, the Scandinavian countries. And at the other end of the ranking, a number of OECD countries, almost known for their government, generally more limited intervention, have more inequality than in Quebec, including Canada as a whole, with a range of, with a rate of 5.4. Five, uh, 5. Uh, 5. So um, unlike its most uh, immediate neighbor, Canada and the United States, uh, Quebec is much less uh, an unequal uh, society. If you look at the income gap, e in economic inequality between men and women, again, Quebec scored quite well there. Income inequality between men and women is smaller in Quebec and in um, uh, PEI. That's where, and in Alberta, that's where it is uh, the highest, the income inequality between uh, men and women. Life expectancy. Again, we see that Quebec scores quite well with Ontario. And uh, if you look between 1981 and between 2010, Quebec has the biggest increase. That's where there's uh, people uh, in, in 1980 uh, were dying at 75.1 uh, years old, but then at almost 82 years old uh, 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 30 years later. So it's one of the, uh, uh, of the best uh, uh, improvement in life expectancy. So my point, and again, this is a student math test. Quebec scored the highest with Japan. Right? So the education system clearly performs well, not too bad as well. So what are the evidence? Quebec does look a little bit like uh, Sweden. It certainly has a, uh, built a, the uh, strongest model of uh, social protection in North America. And let, let, it, let, uh, let me be clear about one thing. When I talk about the Quebec social model, in my mind, there is no doubt that it is also a Canadian model, of course. It has been built with the support with the, in partnership, not in opposition to Canada. No, no, no. Huh? Um, and it is a part of, a, of Canada's commitment to equality and solidarity via its equalization program. Um, and it, you know, so, um, so the Quebec model is also a, a, a Canadian model. And it has developed a European-like uh, welfare state that include universal childcare, active labor market, and a government strategy against poverty and systemic uh, and social exclusion. Sorry. And yet, and yet, okay, Quebec is a, is like Sweden. Of, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're okay, we believe you. But yet, testimony at the Charbonneau inquiry point to our strong evidence of systemic corruption at the municipal level in the engineering sectors, and in political financing. How can that be? Systemic corruption is not supposed to happen in Sweden. Huh? How the, the, the research th that we have, uh, a, a systemic corruption is what you see uh, in the post-Soviet state, you know, in Afghanistan. You don't see it in an, in an advanced welfare state that is similar to Sweden. And how can that be? How, uh, uh, systemic corruption is not associated with advanced uh, welfare state because our theory tell us that 
Yes, advanced welfare states like Quebec, Canada, and, uh, and the other in Europe, they were once, a long time ago, they were systematically corrupt, as John remind us. But they broke free from it uh, in a moment of, in a revolutionary moment of abrupt and wholesale transformation. Uh, Bo Rothstein called this the big bank approach to change, which suggests that societies um, cannot escape the vicious circle of systemic corruption by, by incremental small change. They have to, if you want to get out of systemic corruption, it's not incremental change that will change this, that, that will have any effect. It has to be a revolution. That's the theory we have. My point, and I'm going to end with that, um, is that those theories, I believe that, um, um, that says that, we, that, that society can only uh, go from a systemic political order to one that is not, no, no longer uh, systemic, uh, sy systematically corrupt, uh, I think these theories uh, lead us, uh, they exaggerate the rupture between the past and the present. Uh, my, my key theoretical point in my presentation is that the shift of society from a uh, systemic, systematically corrupt order to a, to a less or a non-corrupt one is not something that is never achieved, it's not, some, it's not achieved uh, once and for all as this continuous uh, model of change leads us to believe. Think, thinking of change as uh, involving the breakdown of one set of institution and its replacement with another makes the analysis blind to the continuity and persistence of systemic corruption as an informal institution of modern societies. And this is especially the case in the construction sector where systemic corruption is the rule. It is the universal phenomenon that occurs in all societies. Uh, and and uh, construction is well known uh, uh, for that. Um, with the quiet revolution, Quebec did have the equivalent of a political big bang, where a lot of good things, as I've tried to convince you, have happened. So yes, with, with, the, the, with the big bang created by the quiet revolution, we got rid of the systemic corruption a la Duplessis and all these things. But it came back because it's always adapting to, to, its, to, to its new institutional environment. So systemic corruption came back, but it adapted to the institutional ar architecture that has been left inherited from the quiet revolution. And what I see in the testimonies at the Charbonneau inquiry, if you look at the patterns of corruption in Quebec, they seem to have the trace of the so-called Quebec social model in at least three ways. And I want to conclude with this. The first is in the economic nationalism that made public policies toward Quebec-based business, notably in the engineering sector, uh, with major firms like SNC Lavalin using their dominant position as a national champion to engage in cartel like practices to raise the price of construction projects. So, one legacy of the Quiet Revolution <coughs> is the creation of an oligopoly in the engineering sector. And what would economists tell us about an oligopoly? They would say the yellow light is flashing. It's not corruption, maybe but it can be a facilitating factor because you have an imperfect market, an oligopoly of SNC type uh, firms, so that's one problem. The second problem is in what I call the Jacobinism of uh, the quiet revolution where the focus of the quiet revolutionary was about building a provincial state. So they focus all their energy on the provincial bureaucracy and public administration, and they succeeded in building a Weberian merit-based professional bureaucracy. But they totally neglected the municipal level. And now 
the chicken come on to roost huh? because that's where we find systemic corruption. Why? Because at the municipal level, you don't have a, a, a professional merit-based bureaucracy. You still have a patronage-based bureaucracy. And as I tell you, the Quebec model is also a Canadian model. So that means in the rest of Canada, where municipalities are also a neglected level of government, where public attention has not focused very much in professionalizing the municipal uh, civil services, that's also a, a weakness in the political system that facilitated the infiltration of corruption. And the last point, not the least, my uh, research suggests that um, well, with the quiet revolution came a lot of good things, but also it came a new politics that divide Quebec society between federalists and, and, and sovereignists. And business people, what is the thing that they hate the most? Uncertainty, instability. And my argument is that this debate made the Quebec business class dependent on the Liberal Party for maintaining political stability, and in exchange of this dependence, party operators have, 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 have ta imposed a tax. And you can see this all <coughs> in the fact that the Liberal Party receives three times more from the business community that has contract with the government than the PQ, even when the PQ is in power. So the Liberal Party receives always systematically more money from firms that live from government contract than its opponent. So there is something systemic here, and uh, I will let you with that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And to conclude our day, Adam Radwanski. Thank you very much. Uh, it's nice to be back at Osgood. Uh, I say that having spent about two and a half weeks here as a law student. Uh, before I realized I wasn't cut out for law and wound up going back to journalism. So we can have a very brief reminiscence after my law school days, if you like. Who taught you? Uh, oh. <laughs> you know what? I went to, in my two and a half weeks, I went to about four days' worth of classes, so I shouldn't even be answering that. <laughs> I, uh, uh, so as you can guess, I'm, I'm perhaps not going to take the most academic uh, perspective on this. Uh, maybe as the last panelist, on the last panel of your day, you might not mind that too much. Um, what I'm, uh, I'm going to talk about a little bit instead um, is kind of give, give you kind of a media perspective on uh, what makes a scandal um, and how, from my perspective, I think that our perpetual focus on the scandal of the moment, um, although it has its benefits, can also uh, be somewhat counterproductive. Uh, I'm going to ask your indulgence uh, to start uh, on, a, on a bit of a personal note on this because uh, I come at it from a bit of a unique uh, perspective as somebody who's both covered scandals and, uh, from my perspective, not been involved in one myself, but seen one very uh, close up. Um, I say that because, uh, as a few people may know, my, my father was uh, briefly the Privacy Commissioner of Canada, uh, a, an experience that did not end well for him when he uh, wound up uh, immersed in an expensive scandal and wound up having to resign. Um, thankfully, that didn't make John's list of the five worst. That would have been awkward. Um, I don't usually uh, speak on that, but I'm just going to speak briefly on it. Uh, he passed away recently. It's been kind of, I've been thinking a little bit about uh, how that's affected my perspective covering scandals as well. Um, and I think looking back on it, uh, it gave me, I think, some, some concern seeing it from that perspective on how we cover these things uh, without getting into the ins and outs of what uh, may or may not have been, uh, what, what his mistakes were, and I think he certainly made some in doing it. Uh, what concerned me a bit was the kind of pile-on effect that one sees in that kind of scandal. Not that it didn't deserve coverage, uh, but realizing it and watching it from there, uh, the way that as it moves quickly and as it becomes the one big story for a brief period uh, in the national capital, or as in a provincial capital that I cover, uh, each allegation sort of gets brought up quickly, quickly becomes gospel, and because there's a race, everybody moves on to the next thing quickly. Uh, and so, so in some cases, they, you know, there's not much of a chance for that even to be properly reported out before there's this kind of pile-on of information. Uh, it quickly becomes gospel that this person did wrong, uh, and they are then, uh, within a few weeks in his case, or in some, some other cases, it's happened in days that I've seen covering it, uh, their careers are over and there's a big asterisk beside them forever. Um, again, not saying whether it's justified or not in any given case, uh, but it has given me a bit of pause and a bit of consideration, because if I'm honest, if I had been covering 
something like that previously. I was fairly young in journalism at the time, but had started getting into it. Uh, I probably would have been similarly inclined to pile on and to quickly, summarily, uh, you know, assess the person as corrupt and, and you know, not actually report it out that well. Um, it comes to mind because when I was uh, interviewed for my job at the Globe and Mail, which was after all this had happened, I was asked uh, by the editor in chief at the time uh, how this would, quite rightly on his part, uh, asked how this would affect my ability to cover politics. And my answer to that was uh, I would still, if there was a scandal, I would still cover it. Uh, but I think I would do so uh, knowing the responsibility to make sure that we reported it carefully um, and took our time with it and didn't, didn't just, just follow the pack for the sake of following the pack. Um, I say all that partly by, by way of disclaimer uh, and partly because I think it has helped uh, shape my perspective on, on uh, the level of government that I've spent the last five years or so covering. Um, and so I want to speak a bit, as I said, <coughs> pardon me, about, from that perspective, of, of what I think uh, makes a scandal uh, at the provincial level that I've covered, um, the kind that captures enough public attention to force change, force resignations, to force rule changes, etc. cetera, um, what I think the criteria are for it to become something that the media will take full notice of, uh, the uh, public will take full notice of, opposition par parties will drive, or in some cases government against opposition parties, but usually the other way around. Um, what, what, what it is that makes that happen, uh, what forces are required there, what criteria, and why I think there's a bit of cause for concern in that. Um, I'll start with an example of, of something that um, I guess didn't quite fit the bill uh, of something that would capture enough sustained attention uh, to merit that kind of change or, or force people out or that sort of thing. This is something I myself covered, so uh, take that for what it's worth. Um, but earlier this year, I, I uh, reported on, I spent a few weeks researching and reported on an issue around uh, how the parties at Queen's Park, the Liberal Party in particular, the governing party in Ontario, uh, was using millions of dollars that are set aside for uh, caucus spending. Uh, that spending by the caucus party, the, the government caucus collectively, uh, and also by uh, uh, individual MPPs. It's supposed to go for things like uh, communication services, training, uh, buying materials, that kind of stuff. Um, what I realized, I heard this anecdotally and spent some time then researching it out, um, was that this was basically a big loophole in uh, accountability laws. We generally have, as a result partly of the sorts of changes forced by scandals that, that John mentioned, um, we typically have disclosure requirements for most government expenditures. It's hard to bury contracts and have them reported. Most of them are subject to freedom of information laws. Uh, legislative spending of that sort is not. Um, under $50,000, per expenditure, it's not disclosed at all. Uh, and where it is disclosed, over 50,000, it just turns up very, very vaguely in public accounts, uh, which are released each year, uh, as to, uh, yeah, as just, just to who the contract went to. Looking through that and looking at who some of the contracts over $50,000 a year went, went to, um, and trying to figure out what they were exactly, um, and then also in speaking to people who uh, cover these, or who, who work in, in, or used to work in government, um, what I got the sense of was that this was basically being used for the kinds of political payments um, that you couldn't get away with if they were on, if they were publicly accessible. This was stuff like uh, contracts going to people who work for the party, sometimes in uh, their spouses' names, uh, sometimes to numbered companies. Um, again, none of this, it was hard to know exactly what it was for because it's not reported out, but it was sort of thing that there was a reason why they were putting it there. Uh, there was also, from what I heard from a, from a whole bunch of sources that I dealt with, uh, there was an issue around uh, this being used to top up the salaries of people who were there. Uh, so in Ontario, you have a sunshine list where your salary turns up to over 100,000. Uh, you might not want it to look too high, so what you could do is get your salary at a certain level, and then they could top you up with a contract to, say, your spouse uh, through this that would then allow you to have a higher salary. Uh, so I reported, I spent a few weeks working on it, um, <coughs> expected it would make quite a splash. Um, it did in that, you know, my editors were happy with it, and uh, I got some nice emails that day saying, oh, great story. Uh, but within a few days, it had pretty much gone away. Um, the opposition parties didn't pick it up. Um, the, uh, the other media didn't really pick it up. 
Um, nobody committed. After, after I forced them into it, the opposition parties kind of said they would close the loophole if elected, but it was, you know, it was pretty vague. And it gave me a story, but I can't honestly say I believe them that they would do it. Uh, and then it went away. Um, now, <coughs> excuse me. I hasten to add this is not because we're not interested in scandals at the provincial level in Ontario. Uh, in the five years that I have uh, been at Queen's Park, uh, there's pretty much always been one on the go. There's been, uh, when I got there, there was the e-health scandal, which related to uh, the government's uh, digitalization of health records and contracts that went out at the time and how those were dispersed. Uh, there was a scandal around the provincial air ambulance service and a, uh, basically a CEO who had run wildly amok uh, and was, was doing all kinds of crazy things with the money. Um, and especially there was the gas plant scandal in Ontario, which anybody who's familiar with Ontario will know, uh, related to the government's extremely expensive decision and politically motivated decision to cancel or at least move the construction of a pair of uh, gas fired power plants. Uh, so I've been thinking quite a bit about why what I wrote uh, didn't get the attention it could have. Now, it didn't have the same kind of dollar figures that the gas plants did, but it had millions of dollars, and that was enough in some cases. That's been enough in some other cases. Um, and it related to people who had just left the Premier's office, the former Premier's office, uh, but were still very much players in Ontario, so you would think, again, that it might have attracted attention. Um, so why didn't it? I, 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 in, in thinking about that, um, and looking at other things that have gotten more attention, I've sort of come to the conclusion that there are um, about five criteria that are there for these th sort of things to get legs that it didn't have. Um, number one, you need a straightforward narrative uh, with a clear villain, uh, or a few clear ones. Uh, so in the air ambulance sc scandal that I mentioned, there was Chris Mazza, who was the CEO who had basically spent all kinds of money without the, his board stepping in properly and ultimately had to resign, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, in the, in the uh, gas plant scandal, although a little less of a, a little less of a, a one-off villain, but, uh, but the former premier, Dalton McGuinty, was really the person who was central to this. Uh, it was his decision ultimately, it was staff on his behalf, but it ultimately did force his, or at least, you can debate that, but it at least expedited his departure from office, uh, and so on. In this case, didn't really have uh, a clear face to this, as I, when I wrote about it. It was, it was uh, you know, several people, most of whom weren't there anymore, most of whom the public wouldn't know, exploiting a system, and really it was more of a systemic issue. Uh, and that ties into the second point that it needs, which is it can't be too systemic in that the opposition parties have to be willing to help carry it, or in some cases if it's an opposition party that's doing something in the government has to be willing to, to carry it. Uh, but in this case, uh, Unlike, say, in the gas plant case that I mentioned, where it was a government decision, or in the air ambulance case, which I mentioned, or in many of the other ones we've talked about, uh, this was a case where basically all the parties are doing the same thing. Uh, in fact, I was told by, by members of the official opposition party that they, had, they talked about this when the story came out, and they said, well, we can't really go after this because they could dig up the same stuff on us. So, okay. <laughs> Second problem. Uh, third problem, it has to be, or third criteria, it has to be something, if you want it to have legs, that other media can easily match. Uh, you know, if it's an emerging story, which basically requires confirmation of one detail, it can be matched quickly and suddenly every outlet's got a story on it, and then they can keep building off of it. When you've spent a long time on something, and it's actually not so much a new development, it's a systemic thing that you've gone in and reported, uh, it's kind of hard for everybody else to immediately match that. I mean, this was not an easy one to summarize in one sentence. Not, not, say, not, not to imply that my colleagues um, were lazy about it, it's actually that and I'll get to more about this in a moment, uh, particularly at the provincial level, we have a rather under-resourced under uh, press gallery. Uh, we have people, and, and a lot of news, are covering a big government, um, and there frankly just isn't time for people to report out every story they could report out. Um, so if you're going to try and give something legs, it has to be something they can get to fairly quickly or else they're going to keep prioritizing their own stories. Um, <coughs> number four, what you need to keep any scandal going is a slow drip. Uh, you need a steady stream of revelations about it that gives it some news energy. Uh, I think we made the mistake, frankly, of, of including everything I had in one story, uh, which then meant that there was really not that much to follow up with, which then meant that if the government waited on it for a couple of days, it was basically going to go away. Uh, 
Uh, you'll see in most of these, uh, and I mentioned the personal example off the top, which was again a steady stream of things that just keeps going until somebody resigns or until there's change made. You really do need a consistent stream of things. Um, and that's in some ways a matter of strategic coverage uh, and some matters the nature of the story. Uh, and the, the fifth criteria, I think, is it needs to not have another scandal already dominating. Um, as I said, we are a rather under-resourced press gallery. Uh, at the provincial level, particularly in Ontario, but I think it's the case not in Quebec so much, but in other provinces, some other provinces as well, uh, there's really only so much public attention for these things. Uh, people don't follow provincial politics, even federal politics really, with rapt attention day to day. Uh, and something has to break through, and to try and have more than one scandal at a time is not easy to get the attention for. Uh, and as I said, it's hard, even, even for an opposition party, uh, which tends to be, which don't have that many resources either, there's only so much they can devote to it. There's only so much airtime they think they can get. Uh, so really, we only have the capacity for one at a time. Um, now, as I said, in retrospect, I think some of these things that I, I talked about the story I was reporting on, we probably could have handled um, a little more strategically, as I mentioned, maybe doing a slow drip, um, maybe putting one face on it a little more than we did, although I think that's dangerous, but uh, perhaps that would have given it a little more energy. Um, but I do want to come back, <coughs> excuse me, to that last one about the capacity of only one story at a time for a moment, because as I said, I think it's particularly a phenomenon um, at the provincial level, and I think it can be particularly unhealthy. Uh, I mentioned the gas plants example, and if you followed Ontario politics the last couple of years, not so much in the last six months or so, but in the couple of years preceding that, uh, this was a constant story. It was almost the only thing that, on a lot of weeks, that was talked about out of Queen's Park. Um, now, I'm not minimizing the importance of that story. Uh, it was certainly egregious, particularly, uh, I think one can debate whether it was corruption or just extreme cynicism that saw the government uh, decide to uh, spend hundreds of millions of dollars to basically try to save a few ridings by not building gas plants there. It certainly wasn't a good decision. Um, whether it was corrupt or, or cynical, I guess it depends on your definition of corruption. Uh, but uh, what followed that, uh, you know, in attempts to cover it up, uh, including, I think, most egregiously an attempt by the government to, an apparent attempt by the government, as shown through emails that were disclosed, to uh, pressure the Speaker of the Legislature into a, a finding, uh, certainly was highly offensive, and to me, I actually didn't get enough attention about everything else in it. Um, but, it's so as I said, it certainly deserved the attention it got. It, if, it, if it did indeed um, push the former Premier of the province out before he would have otherwise left, which he would deny, but I think most people think, uh, that was maybe a good thing, uh, based on, the, on, on what had gone on with this. Uh, but I do wonder, I, should it have been almost the only thing that we talked about here uh, for almost two years? Uh, for one thing, there are a lot of non-scandals, non-corruption issues, non-ethical issues that also deserve a lot of concern and attention in Ontario. I mean, this is a province that has a, at least through much of this, had roughly a $12 billion deficit. Uh, it has uh, much of the province, not so much Toronto, but elsewhere, uh, has, particularly southwestern Ontario, has extremely severe economic challenges. Uh, and very few, few of the parties, I would say none of the parties really, have had a particularly good answer on that. Um, you know, in terms of real world concerns, we are not short on them. Uh, and so I think there is a bit of a concern that we can't have such tunnel vision on a scandal that we don't talk about anything else and actually hold the government accountable on other things. Uh, I think it also may have led us, though, to let the government off the hook by having a bit of tunnel vision and maybe being a bit incurious about other ethical issues uh, or ignoring them or trying to lump them all into this and not actually looking at them in proper perspective. Uh, for example, the, the Ontario Provincial Police uh, launched an investigation, basically at the request of the opposition parties, into the gas plant uh, scandal. Um, the story that came out of it eventually uh, was that they were, they have not actually pressed any charges, but that they were pursuing charges uh, related to the deletion of uh, digital files in the Premier's office shortly before the transition of power from the former Premier, then Premier, to the current one, uh, in the days before that. Now, every story that came out about this uh, pretty much uh, said latest development in the gas plant scandal. Uh, you know, they were, and just made the assumption that they were trying to delete emails related to the gas plants. They may have been doing that. Uh, I just can't help but note in looking at it that they were, <laughs> they were del there were enough staff involved in this who would never have touched this file because you simply don't have all your junior staff dealing with, the, with, with decisions to cancel power plants. Uh, 
that it makes me wonder if they were just doing a blanket deletion and what, they might, what else they might have been trying to delete and what else they might not have wanted out there. For instance, say what kind of contracts you were giving to people funnel through their wives or through uh, numbered companies, for example. Uh, but that's just one. There's plenty of other possibilities. Uh, but there was no willingness to look at that. And in fact, when I suggested, um, I think on Twitter, I suggested that it was uh, possible that maybe this wasn't just about the gas plants and maybe we shouldn't be so quick to just call it part of the gas plant scandal. People just assumed, oh, you're trying to minimize the gas plant scandal. Well, no, it's, it's that we also have to have a broader view of these things. And I think that's, uh, that, that is something that, in terms of our ability to have a broad view, um, causes me a little bit of concern if we're, con if we're trying to ensure not just a quick reaction to individual scandals, but an overall higher level of ethics through government. Um, to be clear, I, I agree with what John said uh, in his talk, that government is certainly cleaner than it used to be. Um, you know, they, they, in some cases, I, I think it may actually, it's going to sound strange to say it's too clean. I think in some cases they've actually responded to scandals with too much process. Um, one of the things that, that you'll hear is that, uh, you know, the, with every scandal, uh, that happens every spending scandal, there's a new layer of regulations added, which in some cases may actually not do a whole lot of favors. Um, you know, if somebody spends $10 on a breakfast in a hotel when they're traveling for business, I'm not sure that to follow up you want to spend $200 worth of time and, and uh, of basically government resources to track down the, you know, orange juice order that put it 50 cents over the limit. I mean, that, that kind of thing can become a little self-defeating, and in a province with a lot of severe policy problems, it can actually become um, a little bit of a, of a barrier to actually moving quickly on policy if, and, and to, to sort of energize the public service if you just keep regulating them further and further. Uh, that being said, there are still going to be people who abuse systems, uh, and there are going to be systems that are too easily abused. Um, and so I, what I'm trying to get at here, and I'll, I'll wrap up and we can hopefully get to a few questions, um, I think the best way for us, uh, I talk about us in media who work in politics and to some extent the public, um, the best way for us to root out those systemic issues or those individuals throughout government, and again, I'm talking when I cover government Ontario, it's a government with a budget well over $100 billion a year. It is a big government. Uh, there is a lot that goes on at a given time. It's not just about the one story. The best way for us to make sure that it's as clean as it can be is to avoid just going for the quick hits on the easy narratives, uh, the ones that, fa that, that uh, fit the criteria uh, that I mentioned earlier. And I would just add, as we do that, uh, we should remember, as I learned from uh, my own experience that I mentioned, uh, that people's livelihoods and reputations do hang in the balance as we cover these things, uh, which to me is just another reason uh, to avoid latching too easily onto whatever the scandal of the moment is. So with that, I, I think I'll pass back. Thank you very much. So according to the schedule, we only have five minutes for questions, but as John suggested, I think the good part of a panel, especially a panel like this, is to allow for, for questions. So I suggest that we take at least 10 to 15 minutes for questions, and we'll start. Okay, so I'll try to be really quick. Um, when I am, um, my, my American legal mentor, every time I see him, tells me a story about when he came up to do an arbitration in Toronto, and he went for a walk and a break in the action and talked to another American lawyer, who turned to him and said, Don, this place reminds me of Little Rock. <laughs> and he says he's turned 80, so he reminds me of that every time I see him. So John, with that in mind, I just question whether you really have, your definition of corruption is too narrow to really get at what's going on in Canada. Because I, I don't know that it matches the perception that other people have of Canada, business people who come to work in Canada, having worked outside of Canada. And I don't know whether your definition of corruption really fits the kind of modern regulatory state. And I think this is where I think Professor St. Martin's contribution was quite useful. I just flew up to Ottawa on Monday. My Porter flight was full of people who work in a lot of different lobbying groups. I never quite know exactly what they're doing or who they're working for or what they're working on. So I, I, just, I, just, I think it's easy if you say, for, they didn't have those groups in the time of Sir John A. and the Pacific scandal. But there's something else going on. And I think if we just say, well, nope, where everything's cleaner than it used to be, we might be missing what's filling up those airplanes and those porter flights between Toronto and Ottawa. Just your answer. Well, uh, sure. Uh, though, again, the word in the front of the, of the poster is corrupt. 
right? It's corruption. It's not uh, improper processes. It's not insufficient safeguards. It's not uh, legislative inadequacy. Uh, it's corruption. Um, so, you know, I take the organizers of the conference at their word and say, I know what corruption is. It's envelopes um, on restaurant tables. It's guys getting their wives on the payroll. It's uh, cooking the, the, the rules so that you can funnel money to your party. That's corruption. If we don't have the regulatory processes in place to um, make everything as transparent and as open as you think it should be, that's a different discussion, but I also would contend it's a different seminar. Um, and and uh, and, the, and, the, and your definition of corruption is just different from mine, uh, which is fine. Um, then, but then we should make sure we have a clear understanding of what corruption is. But uh, and and two very quick points on that: the, the sponsorship scandal, on top of everything else, led to incredibly draconian regulations prohibiting people who work in government from working in the lobbying industry for five years after they leave government, such that the real complaint in Ottawa is that you can't get good staff anymore because there's, there, there's no way they can earn a, a decent living uh, after they quit. Um, and, I, and I'll also just make one very quick parenthetic uh, comment on, on Adam's uh, really fine presentation. Um, the George Ranswaski scandal had an unintended consequence. It proved to be incredibly expensive to the, for the Globe and Mail. Um, and for other uh, outlets, because one of the consequences of that affair was that cabinet ministers and senior members of the public servants have to detail each and every expense, um, including things as minor as a lunch uh, or a dinner. And that meant that any time I or any other journalist in my bureau or any other journalist in other bureaus met a cabinet minister or a deputy minister for lunch, we had to pay because neither we nor the cabinet minister wanted to see dinner with John Ibbotson showing up in that month's expense accounts. So it would kind of tell who your sources were. Kevin. Uh, question for Denise Amatin. Um, in, and thank you for the elaboration of the Quebec model, actually, that was quite interesting. Uh, in some contexts, and historically, there's been a claim that higher levels of government can play a role in policing and combating co corruption at lower levels. Uh, <laughs> so there's some support for the idea that, say, the Federal Bureau of Investigation in U.S. history played an important role in cleaning up corruption at the state and local level. I'm just wondering, and oh, sorry, and the, there are also suggestions that foreign or supranational bodies like the World Bank can play a similar role in some developing countries uh, at their national level. I'm just wondering what you think the prospects are for that kind of uh, intervention in Quebec, the extent to which federal law enforcement might be the solution to the uh, problems of c corruption in Quebec given the political complexities? Well, that's a good question. I think, um, I think uh, in terms of legal instrument, everything is there. Because since the Charbonneau inquiry was launched three years ago, the government has acted as if the, the report has already been made. That is, they adopted several laws. They created the anti-corruption unit. So all the, all the proper uh, uh, legal architecture, regulatory framework is there. The problem is not with the formal institutional engineering. The problem is how do we deal with values and the culture of organization? Because, the, I, because we know from research that's where we're going to act most successfully to change corruption. Uh, we need to change values and belief and, and stuff like that. But how do we how do we intervene, you know, and intelligently with smart regulation on these things? Um, some would say uh, nudge, nudging, you know, uh, nudging people into into a good non-corrupt behavior in public and private organization. This is the challenge for people like us, you know, trying to find ways. So I think the commission will not focus very much on on the law because all everything is there. Say. How do you make sure that uh, there is a culture? And I think with all the uh, um, public opinion mobilization, all the public education, because some say, like um, Lisiane Gagnon would say that the commission is not very useful. Hey, Margaret, uh, Lisiane Gagnon may say that uh, the commission is not useful, but as a public education uh, exercise, 
the commission is more watched than any uh, TV drama on high times TV. So that's good, you know? So people, they talk about it and they become more um, socialized, more aware of it. And I think if you create that atmosphere in public Im imagination, then the law will play its role and people will behave accordingly. Uh, my question is also for the two representatives of the media in the panel, and um, it's about uh, an important correlation that has been generally accepted that uh, exists, the correlation between government transparency and corruption, and a tool um, to test, let's say, government transparency is uh, filing access to information requests. And I'm more interested at the federal level. So uh, how much of the use of this tool is attributed to the detection of uh, corruption cases? Um, and um, uh, what are the challenges that you have faced as media journalists, uh, and not only you personally, but uh, at the Global, Ma uh, Global Mail, other journalists, or other media as well? So what are the challenges that you have faced while using and, request and uh, filing requests to information requests? Yeah, FOIs um, have been valuable tools, uh, especially at the very beginning of an investigation uh, where you want to find out, first of all, what government documents are available and what government documents are redacted, because if they're redacting, then there's something uh, you want to know as to why the, the, the information is being redacted. It's also true, the Harper government um, is particularly egregious in uh, delaying um, uh, the, re the response to FOIs. Um, although all governments have been as well in the past. It, uh, it's, it's very rare that, that um, FO, while FOIs can, can, can produce really interesting information, they rarely offer you a trail to, uh, to something that's actually corrupt. Because again, they're the government documents, and if the government documents said, whoa, is this department ever corrupt? Um, we'd, uh, you know, that, that would be a different issue. So I, I think we have two impulses at work here. Uh, we have a, a greater willingness on the part of government to, to put routine documents out into the public view. The, 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 the gov federal government does, does a good job um, of making routine information available on its databases. The conservatives do it well. The, conserva the liberals uh, did it before. But on, a, and you also have, through social media and through other means, um, an increasing ability for people inside government to pass information on to the media um, in order to, to expose uh, what's going on inside the government. Uh, but on the other hand, you also have media who are challenged, as Adam said, by uh, financial constraints that are more severe with every passing year because none of you read newspapers anymore, but don't get me started. Um, and, um, uh, and, and you have, I think, a, a greater desire on the part of the executive at all levels, federal and provincial, to keep a, keep a very tight control uh, over the flow of information coming out of, uh, out of the Premier's office or the Prime Minister's office. So I don't know if it's a wash or things have gotten worse or gotten better, or gotten better. I, I don't know. Uh, I think they're about the same where I am. I think one, one of the problems that John alluded to there or spoke about is the, uh, is the time, the time lapse between putting it in. Um, I mean, you don't tend to go with an FOI on a fishing expedition where, hey, let's see what's in, sometimes you do, and sometimes you get something interesting about what might be under consideration, say. But you don't find scandals or corruption just by putting in a blanket FOI request. Usually what you do is, uh, you know, you're responding to something you're covering or want to cover by putting it in. Uh, the problem is if there's then a, you know, a, a weeks long or months long lag in getting information back, um, you know, we don't work on that kind of timetable. So that's a real problem, and there's also an issue of what's redacted. And I think that, that touches on something, and it, it maybe touches a bit on the lobbying question before too. Um, for all of the transparency measures, I think we have to be careful there about having consequences for finding ways around the transparency, because what they tend to do, uh, the unintended consequence, I think, of some transparency measures, is that people then find corners to go into and do things, stuff is actually basically pushed underground. Uh, if you look, for instance, at the lobbying um, regulations in Ontario, uh, they, it's basically a voluntary disclosure rule. I mean, you're, you're supposed to, if you're lobbying a government ministry or an agency, you are supposed to register that you're lobbying. Uh, now, the problem with doing that, with that is, uh, there's really no way of telling where people blur the lines on that. And frankly, there's not a great advantage for somebody, other than being ethical, of registering, because what happens is, uh, then you're, you know, you wind up with some story about how you're lobbying on behalf of X, and it makes, you know, lobbyist is sort of a dirty word, and it makes you look vaguely dirty. <coughs> Um, 
meanwhile, somebody can just choose not to uh, and just you know, happen to run into somebody at a cocktail party and talk to them about something or have an underling call. And you know, we have very senior former politicians and, and advisors in Ontario who basically do that. Uh, everybody knows which files they're working on, uh, but they're not actually registering to lobby on them. Uh, everybody knows who's calling on their behalf. And, you know, if you ask them about it, they go, no, no, I'm certainly not. I mean, I, what I'm getting at here is that there are clever ways around these things, and unless there are consequences for not being transparent, uh, whether it's on a lobbying regulation or freedom of information rule, uh, we're just going to have people getting more and more clever about how to get around them. Mariana. Thank you. Um, Mariana Prado, I'm a law professor at the University of Toronto and a member of the, the Board of Directors of Transparency International Canada. And my question is for Denisa Martin. Um, so this is extremely fascinating and, uh, and I guess uh, my research goes very much along the lines of yours in the sense of exploring the importance of the institutional design, right? But the, I think the question that raises once you get to the, your last slide is then how we deal with that. And you, the point you're making to all of us is it's gonna take time for this to change and especially your answer to Kevin was and changing the values is gonna be an important part of the story. So my question to you is considering that institutional design and, and institutional dynamics is largely determined by how you set up these institutions but how the underlying values will influence how they operate, where do you start? Right? Do you start by changing the structures or do you start by changing the values before and the structures will follow? So I would like to hear from you about that and in case you say values, are, aren't we going back to Huntington's initial proposition, it's all cultural and, and thank you. Uh, thank you and I think my answer will go to, the, to, to, to what uh, Adam and John were discussing earlier, uh, transparency. Um, because uh, my point in that presentation is that uh, Quebec's political uh, economy, its institutional architecture within North America is, is a bit different. Uh, there are more government intervention, more state-owned companies, uh, uh, workers fund that invest like <coughs> that in private and small businesses. So there's a lot of uh, concertation. Uh, European would say it's a neo-corporatist type of political economy where you have business, uh, labor, government, and in Quebec's case, the social economy sector as the four pillar of society. And when they meet, they make big decision in summit, like in 1996 when, they, when it was decided to reach the zero deficit, uh, like in, the, in, 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 in solving the student crisis, there was a, a summit of all these actors and that's how big decisions are, are, are made. So um, that means that when you go at intervening to try to curb this political economy from the, from, the, from, from the disease of corruption, you need to intervene finally. You, you, you need to know where to look. Um, and if your argument is that uh, too much government, we just need to cut government, well, that in Quebec's case, that would be like throwing uh, the baby with the water, you see? So that's, that's a bit more of, of, of my point. So it creates a monopoly of, of uh, French-speaking engineering firms. So the first problem is open the market in there, uh, break that oligopoly, and it's in the process of being done because the most efficient law to, co to combat corruption is the brutal law of the market. Look at Deso Engineering Company, which has been eaten away by all its foreign competitors. So that's uh, that sent a strong signal uh, to the market, to firms. So open the market there. Second. Decentralized power, my point, I am a federalist in terms of my relationship with the rest of Canada, but I think we need to federalize Quebec as well within its own domestic provincial structure because the Quebec government see itself as the protector of the Quebec nation. It's very jealous of its power. It wants most from Ottawa and it doesn't delegate anything at the local level. That creates a monopoly of power that is not healthy in a, in a, in a modern democracy. So decentralize, open the market, make the level, uh, the municipal level of government significant in citizens' life. If citizens feel that the, le the lo local level is only about the garbage, they won't go to vote. And in Quebec, 
two-thirds of all mayors, of all local people, uh, are not elected. There's no competition. Huh? So the market, a big market failure there. So open, decentralized. Same thing there. Uh, the monopoly of the liberal party over the business community uh, needs to be broken. You know, that's it. Business people need to be more strategic <coughs> in the way uh, they politically operate uh, with government in modern political economy because when they talk to only one side, that creates a unperfect market. So that would be my short and long answer. <laughs> okay, seeing as there are no more questions, please join me in thanking our panelists.